they speak Portuguese because they were a part of the Portuguese empire. Uh, actually, there was a moment in history where the Portuguese emperors moved to Brazil uh, due to the Napoleonic invasions in Europe. And, and that, of course, brought a lot of exciting new musical life to Brazil. Of course, uh, Latin America has made major contributions to arts. Um, speaking about Nobel Prize winners in literature, for example, some of the most important uh, recent winners are from Latin America. The, the, I think the most recent winner from there uh, is a Peruvian, Mario Vargas Llosa, who is still alive. Also, the writer of 100 Years of Solitude, Gabriel Garcia Marquez from Colombia, uh, other major writers like Pablo Neruda or Gabriela Mistral are from Latin America, but not only that. Uh, recently, unfortunately, the painter Fernando Botero, who was from Colombia, died. I think he was yesterday at age 91. He was famous for his for his uh, paintings of people that, uh, you know, they, they had, I, I don't know how to describe it. You, you, should, look, you should look at, what, at Botero's paintings. There, there are many sculptures, there are animals, there are people, I remember very much one visit that I uh, made to Medellin and I saw a famous painting of, of him about the, the death of the famous, the, there's another side of Latin America, the famous drug dealer Pablo Escobar Gaviria that was from Medellin as well. And uh, of course, uh, we have made major contributions to music. Uh, I was just hearing Hector Villalobos, uh, Bajianas Brasileiras number no. one, that was being performed wonderfully. The, the last movie which is very, very, very difficult to play. So bravo for that. Uh, Hector Villalobos, who was actually himself a cellist, is one of the many composers that have written music for cello in Latin America. And actually, one of the most important things that I have made with music from Latin America is creating databases that are available and online. I, I, I will tell you more about it. That started with a catalog of cello works that was written by my colleague and dear friend, Herman Marcano, uh, in, in, and was published by him in 2004 in, in the shape of a book a printed book, and then we were told his enterprise, he was kind enough to share that with me, and, and uh, updated it and shared it online for the free uh, consultation of everybody. He is there, we will tell you later where to find it. So in 2004, there were already more than 1,400 cello works listed in Mr. Marcano's, Dr. Marcano's, I should say, catalog. Of course, uh, in, Latin, in Latin America, we have had major composers in the past, and these are only a few of those names. Uh, the picture that you see there is of uh, Mr. Villalobos. Uh, you see there a cello in the back, right? That's why I chose that picture. Uh, he actually used to play in the orchestra in Sao Paulo, and I might be mistaken, but I, I read somewhere that he got to play on the Toscanini, because he, Toscanini started, uh, oh no, not Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, sorry. Toscanini started his career in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, and other, other composers from the past that are major composers are Piazzolla, of course, the great tango composer, uh, Argentinian, that also composed a, a beautiful tango for cello and piano. 
Alberto Ginastera, also from Argentina. Um, he was a composer of nationalist roots, roots, so he used the folk music of his country to create his music at the beginning. And then he moved to a highly modern language. Manuel Ponce from Mexico, who was the first a very important na nationalist composer from, Mex from Mexico. He wrote operas and symphonic poems, and he wrote a beautiful sonata for cello and also preludios. I will speak a little bit more about him. Or Teresa Carreño, who was a composer from Venezuela, a pianist, very important pianist in the beginning of the 20th century and the end of the 19th century. There are, of course, major living composers from Latin America. These are some names. Uh, Celso Garrido Leca from Peru, who has a highly modern uh, language. Tania Leon, who actually is from uh, Cuba originally, but she lives in, in this country right now. She's Cuban American. She's a one of the most important composers of her generation. Roberto Sierra from Puerto Rico. He is uh, at Cornell University, a highly in-demand composer. Osvaldo Bolillo from Argentina is also another composer that is highly in-demand. Ricardo Lorenz, who is my very good friend, a Venezuelan-American, recently had a work premiere by LA, LA Field. Or Maria Granillo from Mexico are some of the very important living composers that we have that come from Latin America. All of these people, of course, have worked for cello. Worked for cello. A lot of the composers that I have mentioned uh, actually are more recent. Uh, I believe that the, the oldest the, the one that goes back the most of the one that I have mentioned is Teresa Carreño. But of course in Latin America there, there started to be music very early on. And the very first composer that composed this a work for cello in Latin America was in Brazil. His name was Jose Joaquin Emerico Lobo de Mesquita. He was active in Minas Gerais, which is a region of Brazil is, is known, is, that is known by its mines of, of gold and, and other minerals, very, very valuable minerals. Um, and this richness, this wealthiness of, of that region, uh, of course, impacted the arts when these minerals uh, started being exploited. So Emerico Lobo de Mesquita was a part of, a very important part of that school of Minas Gerais in the 18th century. And there's a little sample here that I will play for you of some of his music. He mainly composed uh, works for voice. of the 18th century in Brazil. That's how it started. Now, I wanted to stop here about uh, talking about the composers and, and because all of you are
younger uh, cellists, uh, and many of you are younger cellists, I wanted to speak about what, how I look at music from Latin America and how have I used it through the years and how it has impacted my own development and that of my students, and not only my development as a, as a cellist, but also as a teacher, right? So we, we know that as musicians, um, we, we are meant to say something original, something that we feel about the music, something that is really exciting that we can share with the audience and that we make the audience feel energized and feel that they have attended something unique, right? That's a real endeavor for us. But it's, at the same time, difficult because we know that we, many of the developed pieces for cello, uh, for example, the back suites of, of which I played one yesterday, are, uh, are words that carry an enormous and, and very heavy tradition of performances by some of the best artists of all times where cello was played. So, um, and then these words were composed by composers that we highly admire and they are a little bit like demigods for us. So, the, there's, there's a little bit of a conflict between the fact of playing something that is so, has been performed so many times by so many great people and at the same time trying to find our own voice, right? So one of the things that I have had fun while performing and using uh, the music from Latin America and composers to teach is because it, it carries less performance tradition and it is just as good as other music that are more widely known, right? So in that regard, I, I, I would give a piece to a student or myself, I would get a piece and then I go on YouTube or Spotify or whatever platform you guys use and I don't find any recordings. And then the students come and tell me, you know, Mr. Contreras, there are no recordings on YouTube. And I say, well, you will have to find out how it sounds with your own sound. But this is something that is really interesting because there was no YouTube in the time of Bach or Beethoven, zero YouTube. There was no YouTube in the time of Mozart or Brahms. So most of the people that used Johann Sebastian Bach suites or play the sonatas by Beethoven, had to find out how they sounded with their own sound. So I believe that using music like the music of Latin America, all other music that are less performed, give us the opportunity to get in direct contact with music and discover how it sounds with our own tools with our own performances, right? Not only that, how many people at, uh, of the people that attended the recital, tell me if you had heard any of the pieces from Latin America that I played yesterday. Nobody, I guess, have heard that, right? So guess what? In the times of Mozart or Beethoven or Brahms, most of the people that would sit in the audience to attend one of those concerts had never heard their music before, the one that was going to be performed. So that makes us, uh, makes us be closer to the experience of those audiences that were actually listening to concerts, listening to music, in concert that what new music to them in the sense that the music that I played for you yesterday was new to you. So that is something that is exciting to me. And I find 
that it has helped me grow as an artistic personality and it's very useful, highly useful for younger people as most, many of you are. Not only that, but we all know that um, diversity is something that, that is very important. I believe that there's no question of uh, about the importance of diversity and the richness that it can bring to our lives. Just encountering people that come from another culture that might have different perspectives from ours. We can enrich our perspectives and our knowledge of the world by getting in contact with and other cultures, other perspectives, right? So you can also do that with the arts of other cultures, or in this case, the music of Latin America, right? Now, it is easy to say, you know, the music of Latin America is like Latin American, but I wanted to be a little bit more specific in this presentation and show you how the music of Latin, how composers from Latin America have drawn different parts of the identity of Latin America and uh, have uh, found inspiration and, and brought into the music, brought these aspects to the music, right? So I chose to show a little bit about how some indigenous uh, aspects or of the music, how also some instrumental aspects from Iberian cultures, uh, Spanish or Portuguese, or African rhythms, for example, are present in the music from Latin America. So we can say when we hear that music that we get in touch with aspects of the culture of important parts of Latin American populations. I, I, I wanted to show you, uh, I, yesterday I played uh, a piece by Esteban Benzegri. Esteban Benzegri is a, a French Argentinian composer, as I said yesterday, he is alive. He actually shared on Facebook this event. Uh, he's always eager to know where his music is played. He has had performance with all of the major orchestras in the world. So he's still in touch with every single performance that he can find, and he really uh, gives importance to everything. So in this case, I wanted to show you a little bit uh, of how his music draws from indigenous culture. So in the Andes, a very important uh, instrument for, for Indian cultures is the flute, right? And, and, and in the flute, uh, there are certain ways of performing that use some ornamentation, some grace notes that you can hear in music, in, 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 in flute music from the Andes. They also use a lot of the pentatonic scale. So I will, I will use the cello a little bit uh, after I play this example for you. And I will show you how that scale is in uh, Benzepi's music. In his case, it's not, I, I don't know if it's totally pentatonic, but it's aspects of that scale is there. But I want to play for you an example first of another one of his pieces where you will hear ornaments like more than ba, 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 that kind of thing. And then I play some flute music from the Andes for you. This is flutes. 
Sam Priyambaba Bhagavan is the same kind of more than Sabra that we're saying in use. So I, I'll go a little bit and show. So it's a lot of pizzicato, it's a beautiful. 
right? So, for example, I'm sure that many of you guys have heard or played Saint Sans the Swan, right? Da -di -da -di -da. So that's from the Romantic period, right? Or many of you have played uh, Rondo by Brevan. It's in Suzuki, right? So that's pretty classical. So in Latin America, there are there's music that comes especially from the Romantic and post-Romantic periods that shows a lot of similar traits in the language, but it's not familiar. So it can educate us not only as performers, but also as listeners. And as, as I said, there are not like really canonic performances that you would say, you know, this is, I want to play the Voyager like Rostropovich. I want to play the Villa Lobos like, like whom? <laughs> so this is, an example of another work by Villalobos, which is it, 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 it's actually a good work to tackle when you're an intermediate advanced student. It's called Pequena Suite, Small Suite. So you will hear some double stops here in the excerpt. Villalobos was a, a, a known admirer of poker, and he was a chemist. So you can see that in his Bacchiana number one. He has some nasty passages there <laughs> in composition. He has really difficult stuff. So it's great to uh, work on the music of the Lobos. And listen to this beautiful excerpt of a double stop movement that is, bears the name of Harmonia Soltas or Harmonies on the Loose or, or, or something like that. Possible. It is so hard to find the music. It's the first cello concerto. It's a good piece. 
there were recordings, and they were like, oh, I, I, I have to do something about it. And I am crazy enough <laughs> to have done something about it, which costed me like two, two and a half years of my life. <laughs> and, uh, and with the help of many, many people, uh, including my wife and, and Herman Marcano, my, my dear colleague, and a lot of younger people uh, that helped with the process, uh, we made a full edition, and I can say with a lot of happiness that today, uh, thanks to that edition and the general support of AFAD working, this is the required piece of the Sphinx competition in its senior edition. This is the required <coughs> concerto. People used my edition, of course, and I am amazed that a lot of people in, in, in the United States now know the very first cello concerto written by a Latin American composer. You will listen here to uh, a recording that was made by Carlos Prieto, who is a very relevant Mexican cellist, he's still alive. He's is in his life, late uh, stages of his life. Uh, he, he is a fantastic cellist and a, and a sponsor of the arts. He's also a, a businessman, very successful. Uh, he plays a lot with Joyoma, actually. And here's a little bit of the recording of this piece with the Berlin Symphony Orchestra. <laughs> It's a great piece. I invite you all to listen to it. The score, there's one, the, the third movement is available for free at, this, at the Sphinx website. If you want to uh, have the whole score, just let me know. We, we sell copies for, for an amount that helps us continue with our efforts. And, and if you see here an, an excerpt of the cadence of the first movement, it's, a, it's not an easy piece, not, user, not so user friendly, but it's, it's very, very rewarding. And I invite I invite you all to, to to take a look at it. Manuel Ponce, who was a, a very important composer from Mexico, also a pianist. Uh, composed a beautiful sonata for cello and piano, and also three preludes for cello and piano. He was, uh, he's known as, as the, I would say, the, the founder of the na nationalist school in Mexico. He was active in the first part of the 20th century. I think he died in 40, 1949. I don't have those days uh, fresh in my mind, but I also invite you all to listen to his sonata in YouTube. He's a small excerpt of it, it's in romantic style. <laughs> Thank you. 
Christian Media and Weeks, the Bastiana Jumper Five, uh, by Villa Lobos, such a beautiful piece. Change a little 
Dante Gardenia are also one occasional concerto or sonata with a, with a, with a graduate student, for example, it is something that is good to explore. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much.